Hey everybody, I'm Josh Gammon. I'm Andrew Nichols. I'm Garrett. I'm David Proc. I should we I should go third now. If Garrett's not gonna be giving out names, I should go third. <laughs> it, it does make more sense. It's it's less of a combo breaker. Though. Listen, my philosophy is if they find the three of you, they're gonna find me. It's That's possible. Maybe it's not, it's, it's maybe we are like all disconnected. Friends everywhere. If they um, follow the show, they see me and they know what's up. <laughs> this is so many sequels. Um Oh yeah. A little our little movie review podcast show extravaganza mm-hmm. um be sure you find look us up online we like that yeah. if you haven't done that yet I mean, we, we know that you're all longtime listeners but you never know there might be one or two new people in here new audience members who haven't who have just stumbled upon our youtube channel or something uh go go check us out on on social media we're on facebook instagram twitter we're technically on tiktok <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah just search so many sequels on all those platforms. And, of course, our favorite social media app, Letterboxd, the social yes. media app for movie nerds. We're, we're there. We're all there, and our show is there. So mm-hmm. go find us there and like and subscribe everywhere else. We're on the podcast feeds and the YouTubes. That's right. Today, though, is a very special day for a few reasons. Well, maybe two reasons. One, the first reason is that this is our last uh, Christmas episode of the month. Christmas oh. is right around the corner, and we have been celebrating all month long with different movie reviews. Santa has been helping us pick out the reviews. We've done The Muppet Christmas Carol, Jingle Jangle, Elf, and now we're going to do the last one. This is Andrew's pick that mm-hmm. Santa helped us out with. If you saw the video we posted on Facebook, uh, you'll see how that was that present was delivered to us. Uh, it was very fun. Santa I got, called Andrew was a whole. Thing. I got to talk to Santa. Yeah, he's yeah. still in. He's still a little little hung up on it. How we I, all talk I, buddy, Santa. we all got to talk to Santa at some point. You're not special here. I, but like, I actually got to talk to him. Okay, I'm okay. I know you're excited. On the phone. <laughs> I can't. It's it's like four year old me just like. A dream come true. Come on. Oh, okay. Is that you, you've had a big year. Um, uh-huh. So today we're going to talk about National yeah. Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. So that's the first reason it's special. The second reason it's special is that this is also our last regular episode of the year. Our last like right. movie review of the year. Our season finale, I guess you could call it, will be coming out before uh, New Year's Eve which will be like our wrap-up show. We're going to go through, talk about some of our favorite movies of the year, our favorite reviews, maybe some of our least favorites. We will recap our most anticipated movies of 2020 that we released back in February. Yeah. I think, I think a lot of people... So that's going to be fun too. because ha- at least half of them didn't, still haven't come out. <laughs> yeah. We, we started this show like four weeks before the pandemic really hit the united states so and the movie industry so that's gonna be fun to talk about so those are there's 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 still one more one more good thing to look forward to after after this episode before we take a break um for the new year but don't worry we won't be on break too long we'll come back there will always be movies (laughs) (laughs) yeah fingers crossed don't put don't put that evil voodoo out there that we make the power streaming services (laughs) i know at least gotta give me something new (laughs) <laughs> Got to give me something new. Got to give me something real. Yes. I yes. need it. <laughs> okay. So all that house cleaning is out of the way. Is that what it's called? House cleaning? Mm, that's a phrase. It can be. Housekeeping. Maybe. Housekeeping. That's what I was looking for. Housekeeping. Of, yeah. It's kind of the same thing as cleaning. Housekeeping is out of the way. Let's talk about uh, Christmas vacation. Um, I forgot to look up when this came out. Was it 1980 what now? 89. 89. 1989. This is... Um, the year Garrett was born. Right, correct. It is part of the National Lampoon's Vacation series, mm-hmm. um, centering around the Griswold family. You've got Clark and his his family. Um, and in this one, we get to see more of the extended family. Um, typically, in these movies, the Griswold family goes on vacation. But in this one, the, the, the extended family go on vacation to them. So mm-hmm. it's a different dynamic from the other movies. Um, so let's just jump right into it. 
this was Andrew's pick, so we'll start with him. Mm-hmm. What made you want to choose Christmas Vacation? And what does this movie like mean to you? How, when did you first see it? All that good stuff. I'm going to start with that second question first. Of course you are. Um, what made me... Uh, uh, when I first saw it, I believe I first saw it whenever I was about seven or eight. And... Okay. And it was out it was, by then. Say what? It had already. It was already out by the time you were seven or eight. Yeah. That was okay. I thought you were seven or eight much earlier. Oh my! No. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> well, uh, um, yeah, about seven or eight, I saw this, um, and ever since then, it's, it's it's been just like a comedy staple. This movie just doesn't fail to make me laugh like and especially around christmas time now uh i will i will explain the reasoning as to why i chose this and it's actually kind of a little bit of a philosophical reason it's not just a christmas movie like to me especially this year it means a little bit more because the thing is is that in 2020 we've had a really hard time all of us have and we've been constantly just kind of just putting up with all this kinds of shit and everything has been going on and nothing's been going nothing's been going well this christmas season is finally kind of coming back a little bit it's the time of giving it's the time of uh making things just a little bit better and what better way to have what better way to have this than to have some stupid comedy just to make you forget about your troubles for 90 minutes. And it genuinely makes you laugh. It genuinely makes you like just forget about everything and just see this. It's truly a gift right now that we had this movie. And I think it just makes me appreciate this movie just a little bit more. And that's why I chose it. And to end it on even to end it on a note of, of hope uh the last line of the movie is the last line of the movie clark just says i did it well we got out of 2020 we did it (laughs) buddy we ain't there yet (laughs) careful now careful now there's still there's still some days left you're going to tempt fate yeah you are tempting fate you better i'm knocking on wood right (laughs) you better knock on wood (laughs) Could this year get any worse? Right, right. I did ironically, so I think we're fine. But, Andrew, do you like the movie? <laughs> no, he hates it. <laughs> Two and a half stars. Two and a half stars. No, I, I personally love this movie. And I've always loved this movie. Whenever Christmas is around, this movie... Can, whenever the day after Thanksgiving, uh, this movie immediately comes to mind. Like... When am I going to watch it? Who am I going to watch it with? I'm going to watch it by myself. I'm going to watch it with you guys. I'm going to watch it with my folks. There's literally like a giant pool of people that I can watch this with. And no matter who you watch it with, it never gets old. And yeah. it's just a, a modern Christmas staple. Now well, I'm glad you do... shared it with us this year then, Andrew. Yeah. Yep. Now, now I want to do a social experiment with you, though, where – uh, we have you watch it on like a w- hot June day and see if it still is funny to you. <laughs> I used to watch it in June, so go ahead. Of course. What a you're such a strange individual. <laughs> you know what? He is. I'll take it. I don't he care. <laughs> you are you are our own cousin Eddie. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In a way, I am wearing my robe. So yeah, there. yeah. And we're dressed for the part. Yep, and the shitter was full. Shitter's so always full. <laughs> 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 and i'll say i uh, you know i watched i watched it with you and th- <laughs> i commented to garrett that this is the hardest and longest i've ever s- seen you laugh in a movie particularly <laughs> one that you've seen uh, uh, assumedly countless times <laughs> you were a constant giggle fest <laughs> yes <laughs> Andrew, did I feed into that at all? Because I was too. Uh, kind of, yeah. Like, yeah. Um, there's, like, you were giggling right beside me. Yeah. Josh well, so, so like, we went, they, they showed it on the big screen. And so we got 
tickets and, and watched it on the big screen. And uh, man, it was it was just so silly. I think uh, it was. I think it was better theater. seeing it in the theater. Well, I mean, yeah, but I would start. Did you guys laughing. go to a theater without me? It was a last minute call. It was very. When did you, what day was this? Yesterday. It was literally yesterday. Yeah. That we decided. <sighs> Sorry, David. Shout to the heart, then is. <laughs> last, I week, I, last week I referenced a Ricky Martin song called Diasporo Corazon, which is shot to the heart. Oh. Well. And uh, that's how I feel right now. We broke David. Always left behind. The Christmas spirit <laughs> is dead. We've ruined it. Sorry, ruined David. It it's okay. It was bad enough because I was going to go see um, uh, the the Chadwick Boseman movie this weekend and uh, the snow kind of kept me from getting there. Yeah. Is that the Ma Rainey's Black Bottom? That's it. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, well. Oh, well. Hey, it, it may be next weekend. Was there a lot of people there? What, how did it go? Was it a good crowd? No. No. What a just big thing. A handful. Up, just a handful. We were definitely the loudest laughter. Laugh, Enough to feel laughers. comfortable. Yeah, I, I do. I do feel like the energy in that room was off. Then again... I was too busy laughing to even notice. I didn't really. I mean, it was a. It was there were only a handful of people in there, and it was a random Tuesday or Monday night. Mm -hmm. That is a lot of reasons you think they could explain the. Yeah. The offness of the room, but anyway, mm -hmm. uh, who who wants to go next in talking about Christmas vacation? Any takers? Uh, I'll go. Uh, so I I uh, I watched it here uh, with my wife alone. Um, and, uh, I actually found it to be pretty funny. Um, it's, it kind of, it's very like late eighties. I know this isn't quite the same, the exact same time frame, but it reminded me a lot of like Caddyshack and Ghostbusters and things like, you know, that just, that, that era had a very like cynical, dry humor that was just, uh, it hasn't really been replicated quite since and, uh, mixed with a lot of, a lot of slapstick um so there's plenty of that kind of thing it, it was very uh it, it was outlandish at times uh and in a way that i wouldn't expect uh i i should say this is my first time ever seeing it and i believe it's the first time seeing a uh a, a vacation movie at all wow. um as, <laughs> wow as you would imagine uh, wow as you would imagine going up in a preacher's home the uh, crassness <laughs> of the Lampoon family or the, the, you know, the, the Griswold family wasn't necessarily something that my parents quite were like, yeah, let's show our eight year old this. Sure. Um, that makes sense. But, um, but that said, uh, I found it to be uh, walk a, a, a decent rope. Like it's, it's pretty crass. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty edgy uh, in a lot of ways, but there is a good amount of, laughs everybody can get like it, it's not like it's not uh, inaccessible and it's fairly tame by today's standards in a lot of ways it's really uh, one of the cleaner vacation films anyway yeah, yeah. and uh i found um i found clark griswold to be kind of a really interesting character uh because there's just so much you could really dissect him i don't know what how the other movies carry this but you could really dissect what it is like you could dissect him in a lot of different ways. And I think there's a lot of different takes you could have on him. Um, and I can get more into that later, but I found it to be a very funny movie. I laughed, uh, I laughed out loud quite a few times. Um, I felt like it kind of, the ending I felt kind of fell apart a bit um, after his big rant about his boss, but still it closed with, uh, but the closing was good. Uh, they just kind of like went, all right, throw everything at the wall now and so like every 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 crazy thing they could do they did but it was i i, I found it to be very funny and i was uh, pleasantly surprised for julia louis dreyfus to show up that was that was really fun yep all right garrett i <clears throat> uh am the opposite of david where uh, i have seen this movie for many years um uh, it is a, a powders family tradition on christmas eve Mm -hmm. um, and has been for 20 plus years. 
I would imagine. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've seen it all, upwards, of every, upwards of that many times, yeah. Many times, plus however many times I've just watched it uh, because I want to. So um, I, I'm in the same boat as Andrew where I very much enjoy this movie. Um, <clears throat> I, I get to a point where the, the slapstick of it isn't really what I laugh at the most. Um, watching it so many times, you, you pick up on things over and over again. You, you see the slapstick and that's the, the easy laugh. Um, mm. But I remember watching it so many times and having these moments where I realize, oh my God, I've never noticed this before, but when the doorbell rings, it gets more monotone and darker and, and scarier every single time. And that's funny. Um, the comedic timing between everybody, uh, the build up to a bit that I know what's gonna happen, which causes me in the theater to laugh at the end of the bit, at the start of the bit, and then I just keep laughing because I'm laughing at all of the things that I know that are funny that lead to that bit. Yeah. Um, you know, you can quote it by uh, memory. I've got, my shirt has one of the quotes on it that's about the eggnog. Uh, Cousin Eddie, everything he does is iconic. I mean, it's just everything about this movie just really for me is hilarious. Yeah, I can definitely see why it is a traditional movie for uh for some people um i was gonna say for a movie that this might be one of the better uh christmas movies or christmas comedies that doesn't actually happen on christmas or go, get to christmas the movie ends on christmas eve so uh it's probably gonna be hard list to to, to look at but for a movie that <laughs> never actually takes place on christmas it's a one that's a really fun movie and um i think at the end of the day, it's just a really good vehicle for Chevy Chase. I don't really know how I feel about Chevy Chase personally in, anymore, but... Uh, I'll tell you how I feel. Yeah, he sucks. It's, <laughs> it's not bad. good, man. It's too bad he's funny. So it's I read, too bad he's funny. I know. I, I was reading about some of the development, and do you want to know who was originally slated to direct the film? Chris Columbus. Chris Columbus, that's oh, right. Wow. But he that. and Chevy Chase had personality clashes, go figure. And uh, find someone who doesn't have a personality clash with with Chevy Chase. That know, seems to be finding Chevy Chase has had personality Chevy Chase has had personality clashes with right. inanimate furniture. It's like a um, sometime man, the problem is you. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'll never get over the thing with community, right? No. Where he was acting like so the the thing about that that stood the most out to me, you guys may remember this. So he was kind of butthurt about being on community all the time for some reason. Like, uh, I think one of the things he was quoted as saying was that uh, the TV show was, like, doing a TV show was beneath him at that point or something. And then, like, he leaves community, and, like, literally a year later, he's doing commercials for Target, where he's recreating the Griswold family. And I was like, if, if, if TV shows are beneath you, good grief commercials really must be, because <laughs> that's just hard to believe. Anyway, um... Well, but this was a movie. So the writer he's on, now he's on now he's making money with cameo. Yeah, if you really want to get below beneath TV and commercials, a lot of people make money on cameo these days. That's true. Uh, Do you guys read that thing about the the actor who played Kevin on The Office made a million dollars on cameo this year? Yeah, that's pretty cool. Wow. Um, but anyway, this movie did bring together Christopher Chris Columbus and uh, John Hughes. Mm -hmm. um and so they ended up doing home alone together so got something good out of it another movie where the majority of it takes place before christmas mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that one Josh, does what do you feel like how do you you haven't really gone over your thoughts about the movie i haven't um i was just letting the conversation kind of roll naturally mm -hmm. um i enjoy it quite a lot i this is a movie i typically watch every year as well i wouldn't say it's like one of my traditions where there's like set aside time for it, but I would be hard pressed to name a year I didn't watch it at some point. It mm -hmm. just is one that I don't really, uh, I don't really escape it, it happens. Um, so I've seen it quite a bit. I enjoy it a lot. Um, this was my first time seeing it in a, in a theater and that always changes the dynamic a little bit. Um, you know, like any movie, any comedy can be funnier in a crowd. 
of course there wasn't a crowd but it's still there's still that atmosphere of mm-hmm. being in a big room um and taking it in on a big screen you see and notice and just kind of appreciate things that you don't on a the small screen in a, in a, on a TV in your living room where there's all kinds of distractions and stuff i mean that's usually where a theater is where i'm able to escape into a movie a lot better and so there was a lot of things well no there wasn't a lot of things i noticed differently this time it was more like seeing it and really engaging with it as an adult i saw it in a different way which was that <laughs> uh clark griswold is a not not good man <laughs> yeah he's not a good man no he, he's funny and he's stupid but he's also like pretty pretty like skeezy yeah he's he adulterous <laughs> he's adulterous yeah he's yeah no and, and he's, like he's a creep yeah <laughs> so that's it's weird to say that's funny it's not, but like it is, because he's so aloof. Yeah, um, he's very hapless. Yeah, and not just that, but like he spent seven thousand dollars without <laughs> consulting his wife. Yeah, that's not a good move. It's like, dude, and she's barely like, she's like, okay. <laughs> yeah, she's like, mm, I don't like that you did that, but all right. I'm getting a pool out of it. I think this is more a sign of the times than anything, but it's just hilarious to me that at one point in time, companies just gave Christmas bonuses. Yeah. I've never gotten that, that nor known anyone who has. <laughs> but I know it used to be a thing. Yeah. I think I, I think I got a Christmas bonus when I worked at a church. It wasn't like, hey, here's 20% of your salary. I was going to say, that probably wasn't enough to cover an in-ground pool. But no, it was like, <laughs> I don't know, it was like an extra 50 bucks or 100 bucks. It was just kind of like, a, hey, thanks for all that. Because the end of the year is kind of a lot of different, a lot of work for yeah that type of thing. But yeah, no, it's uh, it's definitely a very different time. And it's a different right. time in a lot of, in, in a lot of places, this movie's like, it wasn't necessarily that things wouldn't fly today. It's just the presentation would have to be so different. Right. Well, one thing that I think wouldn't fly as well in a movie today is the idea that this family, the Griswolds, who are clearly pretty well off, are like, eat the rich at the end when he literally wants to have his boss kidnapped because he didn't give him a Christmas bonus. Mm -hmm. And it becomes this weird uh, dichotomy of the upper class versus the middle class yeah. but their version of middle class is very rich for today's standards yeah they had a very nice house very nice and, very large house and i mean they don't necessarily appear to be like i don't know like affluent or anything like that but it definitely didn't look like uh they were living paycheck to paycheck well it's funny because <laughs> they have a they have this pretty large house but um this horrible station wagon <laughs> Um, Clark says he didn't eat, he, he dropped the $7,000 down payment on the pool, but said that was more than what was in his account. Mm-hmm. So there's this weird mix of like, they're rich, but they aren't, I don't know. Those are yeah. just the things that I notice now as an adult engaging with this movie that were funny to me. Um, and a lot of it is just societal changes over time. Yeah. Um, Let's see, where can we move to next? Um, I was just going to say, I I share a lot of the same same thoughts being a first time viewer, looking at it from this perspective and and watching it, not, not, unfortunately not watching it from a perspective of, hey, I'm going to pop this movie in and see it if I enjoy it. It, You're watching it a bit more critically. Um, I think all four of us are probably watching it a little bit more critically this time. So certain things you might notice that you wouldn't necessarily think too much about. But a lot of things you mentioned there. Uh, yeah. Sorry, and none of those things I have I have problem with. They're just things that I have yeah. I have noticed that stuck out to me as mm-hmm. as things that have changed over time and are perceived in different ways. Um, I I want I, you know you were you were talking about the sign of the times. 
one th- and sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, please do. Uh, <laughs> especially with like whenever they were talking about like their credit cards, like whenever you saw a credit card transaction, I saw that giant, too. That giant, the big, the yeah. Big. I don't, I don't even know what you call that, but like, yeah, like it's. I've like, never seen one with my own two eyes. <laughs> yeah, uh, you use that, and then you use that, and I guess like three days later, it gets charged to your account. I don't know how that works. I don't either. But like, I, but, like but yeah. Uh, it's almost <clears throat> like that older, that older technology is harder for me to understand than current. <laughs> like you, yeah, you slap, you slapped it with a, with like a paper cutter machine looking thing. Yeah. And yeah. what, did it go through a phone line? I don't know. Yeah. It's what it's supposed to do is that, what it's supposed to do is that you lay like you lay the credit card down on the thing and then you put like a piece of paper on it and then that and then when you roll that over it rolls the numbers on it hmm. presumably <laughs> um but, this makes me feel but, young and i like it but uh this say what go ahead well like yeah i thought it was interesting that i, f- I forgot who mentioned this i don't know if it was you david or garrett but uh that like yeah it's a vacation movie but they stay home Mm. right yeah yeah it's the rest of the family that vacations yeah Yeah, yeah. it it doesn't it doesn't make sense that it's the kids are on christmas vacation right yeah well before i look it up does anyone know which one in the series this is this is three third this third okay this is third and and someone correct, correct me if i'm wrong but like while the family stays the same they're not like connected really you don't you can just jump into any vacation movie i'm pretty seems sure. to be no yeah, you can. while i was looking into this so while the movies technically take place in the basically we have no confirmation of when the movies take place chronologically other than we do know that they seem to take place in the year in which they were filmed because all the cars match up all of like the calendars that you can find match up with the years in which they were filmed which makes it really weird because from what, I, from what I read, uh, Russ, is it Russ? Is that his name? Yeah. yeah. He's like a teenager and then a late teenager in the first two movies, and then he's back to being 11 here. So, like, he de-aged uh, over the course of two over the course of two. Well, films. and the kids, I think the kids change actors at certain points. In, in every movie, yeah. Every movie, it's a different, it's a different, um, different Griswold kids. And uh, that was something Chevy Chase apparently said that, um, it was his favorite part of the movie because it justifies why he keeps what like why Clark Griswold keeps wanting to go on these vacations and get his family closer together yeah. because he looks up and he doesn't recognize his kids anymore. Ah, uh, yeah. I mean, so in this movie, we get Russ is a is a young Johnny Galecki, so that's yes. exciting. A very, I mean, like almost unrecognizable. Johnny Literally, Johnny I think. Garrett. Yeah, he. I think he is. Personally. Young Garrett Powders. Oops, sorry, <laughs> a Garrett. We look like each other. What can I say? I want. I'll take it as a compliment. <laughs> Uh, but, okay, you should have dressed up as 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 uh, Russ Griswold. I always am. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about some of the family members, okay. the extended family who arrives. What a cavalcade! Exactly, uh, insane people. A- <laughs> Literally, <laughs> the most insane people. You've got um, <laughs> Doris Roberts coming in as mm-hmm. as Ellen's mom. Yeah. Um, her husband, you got Clark's parents and, um, Clark's dad and Ellen's dad are just in every scene, just yelling nonsense at each other. Like two old men. It doesn't matter what they're doing. They're yelling at each other. Nonsense. You can't even, I couldn't even make it out. They're yelling about, I wanted the potatoes, not you. you (laughs) Right. It's that kind of stuff. It's just like. The most whatever, like they just, these two guys just hate each other, except for the one time where they fall asleep watching a parade together. Like, can't stand one another. And then can't the parent, the moms don't like each other that much either. Dorothy Roberts does not like Clark Griswold. Uh, it's just, it's just, well, what like, a terrible idea to bring them together for Christmas. Well, like, both, like both of Ellen's parents don't like Clark. They just <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, they don't like her one. They don't like him one bit. Yeah. Um, you've got uh, who are the, some other notable ones before I get to like oh you got the, the obvious ones. The great grandparents or the great aunt and uncle? Yeah. Wait, are those the 
are you talking about Aunt Bethany? Yeah. Okay, so they were going to be one of the ones I talked. To, I want to talk about last because. Oh, okay. It's fine. I don't think the other ones are very memorable I'm to think outside of the of, other you know, ones. The 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 Quades, as I'm. Yeah, call. the Quaid family. So everybody everybody talks about cousin Eddie, but I think people sleep on Lewis and Bethany. <laughs> they, they are. Did. They are maybe the funniest. I think. Just oh, yeah, the, from their first entrance. And Lewis's first entrance, I'm going to consider it up in the attic when we see him on the film, and he's just constantly swatting young Clark away from presence. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but he looks the same. <laughs> the cig- giant cigar and everything. Yeah. And then when they actually enter, I immediately am laughing at the idea of a cat in the box. Mm-hmm. The jello mold what? in the other box. Oh, yeah. Yes. The, sh- <laughs> right. the jello mold that we later learn is full of cat food. Um, <laughs> Bethany <laughs> screaming, or not screaming, but saying the Pledge of Allegiance instead of Grace at the dinner table. Mm-hmm. Hilarious. Lewis, um, just, or Lewis and Bethany just sitting there in silence while everyone loses their shit over the squirrel. Right. That cracks me up. To the tree burning down with the cigar, all the way to the final one of the final things he does, which is explode Randy Quaid's poop gas. Yeah, his glow, green glowing poop gas, and launches himself into orbit. <laughs> yeah, and they then, are Eddie singing the national anthem. <laughs> they kill me. Yeah. They are so funny. They are very funny, and and you're right. People do sleep on that presence a lot because it is so subtle compared to um cousin eddie i mean cousin mm-hmm. eddie and his ridiculousness is so in your face that their subtle hints of just aloof oldness is such a nice complimentary side piece that yeah. is just peppered in so well like yeah. when when they're at the table saying uh or getting ready to to pray and, and eat and do all that stuff and and they say uh, we want to have Bethany to say grace. And they're like, and she's like, what? And they say grace. She says, grace, she passed away 30 years ago. It's just hilarious. Oh, just say. Yeah. Just those <laughs> yeah. two work so well together. They're both funny individually. I mean, you know, I, he's one of those guys that you, he, I've seen him in a bunch of stuff. But I don't like know who he is or what he is or like why. But yeah. uh, she's the original Betty Boop. And so she's just like built into like old time comedy, which plays well in a ridiculous movie like this, which gives you, you know, your slapstick, your comedic timing, your like over the top funny old time humor with her. Yeah. It, it, it's got humor from all over the place. Uh, and they do a great job of being old. <laughs> yeah. It's- they do a great job of being great, great grandparents at a big family reunion like this. Yeah, it's good old fashioned dementia humor. Yeah. And uh, can't get away with that these days, you know, we're worse for it. Um, it's, no, they are, they honestly, they, um, they bring to life the last act of the movie because uh, one of my only real complaints with the movie is that there's, ele- it, it's at times some gags kind of get repetitive and I, I understand by the end, some of those gags are to set up the final moments. There's a lot of build to like the explosion and the gas and the, and the tree and all that. Um, but um, whereas Ed, cousin Eddie coming in sort of around the 45, 55 minute mark, he brings a new dynamic to the movie uh, because now here's this annoying relative that Clark hates and doesn't want to deal with uh, the aunt and uncle coming in and just immediately Oh, are we going to the airport? No, no, we're, we're at Is the house, your house now. On fire clock? When did you move? No, we've lived here for for the last fifteen years. Is oh. Rusty still in the navy? Is, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's just, it's just so it 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 brings a whole different. Uh, thing for them to deal with. The whole movie is a comedy of errors because it's just one worst possible thing could happen after another. And so you got this tree that's been dried out because the dog keeps drinking all the water. You got this guy who won't stop smoking cigars all the time. Right. Uh, that's hilarious. 
And then this, you know, uh, at this point, forgetful uh, uh, woman who just is in her own world at this point and has packed, she just packs up, she doesn't buy gifts anymore. She just packs up things she finds in the house and brings them. So uh, that, and, by, and also the, the cat, uh, 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 you know, disintegrating itself. Uh, yeah. That has to be one of the funniest unexpected I've had in a little while because I just I saw what was happening, but yeah. I didn't process where it would end. Yeah. And so when the lights go, when it goes like, and you hear, I just went, oh no, <laughs> like yeah, I was, that's... I was, I was the oh no no TikTok right now, <laughs> and I was just, and then they pulled the thing back and they're like, and it's just a imprint. <laughs> It's like yeah. a coyote, wily coyote imprint on the ground. That's where the movie starts to to like reach its its peak, um, cartoonishness. Really, yes. Where yeah. obviously that's not how that would happen. Yes. <laughs> With an actual wily coyote imprint and the cat just gone. That's and the, you know they they're wheeling the they're wheeling the, uh, the 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 chair out or they're rolling the chair out to the lawn and cousin A just you know. Uh, I can take this chair off your hands. It's not too bad. Uh, right. How much it set you back? <laughs> right. How much yeah. did a chair set you? Back? And it does just progressively turn into a nightmare for them to the up to the point where, right before we hit peak insanity with the SWAT team busting through the windows and doors, mm-hmm. Clark says something along the lines of, "How could it get any worse? We're on the edge of hell, or something yeah. like that." And then, boom, it gets worse. Smash, smash, smash like the most extensive SWAT team interaction I've ever seen. Yeah. Um, one of my, one of my favorite scenes is in that uh, SWAT scene. Um, and it's another one where again, you, you don't see it on a big screen. Um, and sometimes, you know, as watching it so many times, you don't pay attention to certain things. And so this is another one where it just caught my eye one one year that I watched it. And I was like, Oh my God, I've never seen this before. But during that SWAT scene, when they tell everybody to freeze, Beverly D'Angelo is cupping Chevy Chase's D and B. Yeah. And <laughs> they freeze for a second and then there's something that goes on. They have a conversation and um, they <laughs> introduce each other and then she shakes hands and then puts it right back where it was. Yeah. And that when I found when I saw that, whatever year that I saw that, um, I just lost it. And then I looked into it and Beverly D'Angelo was like, I just kind of improv that. Like I told Chevy I was going to do it just to see if anybody on set would notice. Mm -hmm. And we took like two, three takes and nobody said anything. So I just kept doing it. That's so funny. I didn't notice when they were frozen, but I noticed when she went back, I was like, yeah. Well, and, and I think that's what happened the year that I saw it is I saw her hand go back and I went, what? And so I backed it up and I noticed that whenever they froze, that's how she froze. And so she just went and it was just one of those, small things that's really funny i i think that's like i think it's the beauty of this movie is that like you can you can go back and find things that you didn't know that were there Mm -hmm. and it just it just makes you appreciate it even more i agree one of the things that i noticed this year is just i really noticed beverly d'angelo's performance in this because she's very funny yeah. She's basically the straight man, but the way that she delivers things and her facial reactions to things <clears> like one of the funniest scenes in the movie is at the very beginning when they drive underneath the truck and they just show a close up of her say of her face and she's just like she's terrified. <laughs> she's just wide eyed, dead, and like it was just well delivered. And and there's a moment that really stood out to me where Clark is just in awe when the lights finally turn on and he starts hugging everybody. That's such a big moment for him. And Beverly D'Angelo gets sandwiched between Clark and his mom. And you just kind of see her head just floating there. And she's just in the middle of this tender moment, just like looking at each other like that. It was just something that was really small that she did to be really funny. You just mm-hmm. probably don't notice something like that because of the situation with Jamie. Yeah, At least was, I never have. Yeah, she was really solid in this. I thought I found her to be be a really understated performance, but very funny. And also, when they were eating the turkey, yeah. Oh, oh she flips yeah, the fork. Yeah, she just just kind of flicked it away and went along. Not, with it. Not <laughs> a bad turkey move too. That enough. was the whole thing. Yeah. But, it's a little uh, dry. 
I will say if there's one character that I really, really liked, it had to have been it had to have been Clark's dad. I really like Clark's dad. I okay. like Clark's dad. I mean, like, he just seemed like the all around like he just seemed like the all around guy who was just he was always just really like really good to really good to everybody and really good to him and really good to everybody in general. And he just seemed like like a genuinely nice person. I really do and that that was one thing I'm like, yeah, he he just seems like a nice guy. Yeah. I'd go have a drink with that guy. So I I did a really like good moment scene. there towards the end too. Yeah. I, I was gonna bring that up. I think that moment there's for me again, watching this movie so many times, you get you see it from a bunch of different perspectives. And so um those moment that moment is one of the moments where I feel like they have a bit of relief when it's needed. Because this movie is so over the top that it can be tiring um, and, and it can get repetitive, like you said, David. And so you need a bit of realness. And so there are s several moments that I feel like they get real as far as like this movie can be, getting back on message of like the whole Christmas spirit and, and that moment with uh, uh, Clark and, and his dad is one of those moments where I feel like it's back on message of, you know, <clears throat> he's, he's not he's wanting this perfect Christmas and everything mm -hmm. is messing up and he's handling it poorly. And that's what people are going to remember. Not how you, you know, how you treat your family and how you do all of that. How you, it, it may not be the best Christmas, but how are you handling it in stride? And so that was a nice moment to kind of get back on message. Another one that they did was uh, Clark and Ruby Sue after the pool scene. Um, mm -hmm. That was another moment where it was like a little more calm. You can see uh, Clark is a, Set about his situation that's going on even in the big like societal picture you know you put it at the family level you understand there is some level of panic there and there there would be if he's you know even if he's at that certain level from a family level if he's got something that he expected and didn't get it that would still be scary from a family level um, yeah there's there's a little bit of sentiment there's um you know chevy chase does actually have a certain level of sensitivity he brings to some of the quieter moments of this movie. Uh, I think about that scene, the scene where he's uh, sitting in his office and the guy comes by and says, oh yeah, my uh, Christmas bonus, I guess, got dropped off the other day. And he's kind of like sitting there like really dreading that he's not going to get it. When he goes to his boss and drops off the present and you can kind of read on his face that he knows something's not right. Um, you know, like it's a little, they're, 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 they're not the highlights of the movie, but they are these nice little, you know, character moments that really kind of, allow you to continue to see that the Clark Griswold is a real person. He's not just kind of this, uh, you know, passive aggressive yeah. monster that he is for the rest of the movie. Yeah. Well, no, and, and, and you're right. You know, he's not a good person overall. Again, you look at all his, I mean, David, this is the only vacation you movie that you've seen, but to my mm -hmm. recollection, at least in two of them, he <laughs> has some kind of, uh, a fantasy affair with another woman yeah um, i can't remember if it's in every single one but it's at least in two of them it's been a while since i've seen european vacation and uh, vegas vacation yeah i've not um, seen yeah but it, and so like yeah he's not a he's not a good dude but again you look well, at it from just like from this family's perspective mm -hmm. and and that's where i try to find that humor in there it makes a little more sense if you look at it from if you look at it just from this guy is trying to throw this big family thing and it means a lot to him and everything's messing up and everything's falling down around him and he's a goofball himself. And then he's got this idiot cousin who's doing crazy things and everything is just falling around him. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the, the more fun world to look at for this particular movie. Yes. He's not a great kid, but like look at it from a very family perspective. And that's where that story really comes together for me. And the laugh is there and it's just silliness. Can I ask you guys a question um, and, and answer it in any order you want to? But so watching this movie, I'm trying to get a read on Clark Griswold. He seems like he wants, he's like a wannabe perfect dad. Like he envisions himself as Ward Cleaver, you know, he's like, uh, does everything right. His, you know, his kids are taking, you know, he's taking care of his kids. He's spending time with them. He wants to be the perfect dad, have the perfect this. His wife talks about, oh, you make a big deal about graduations and weddings and anniversaries and, you know, holidays, this, that, and that. Um, he seems to also be driven a lot by, I feel like a need for praise and adulation. Like he wants to be thought of 
as a like a respectable dad is that kind of the the theme for his character because it seemed like it was here yeah he, he's yeah. big on family it matters to him it's a it's a very important thing and he yeah <clears throat> the problem with clark is that he wants to be this great dad like you said and have this great family but every time he goes about it in the worst way possible. And that's where the funny comes in. If you like looking at Christmas vacation in particular, he doesn't really focus on family or the holiday. He's driven by materialism. Mm -hmm. He wants the biggest tree possible. He wants the biggest light display possible. He wants the, the, the money for the pool. He gets lost in the material things and misses out on the experience he, with his family during the holiday. And that, that is an issue with other movies. You know, I'm, I don't remember them as well because I haven't seen them as much, but one of the vacation movies, he's ju- they're just hell-bent on going to a theme park. And it's mm-hmm. like, that's not really the point. And he misses, he, his, where he's funny is that he misses the point every time, no matter what. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he, he seems he's like, be- his intentions are good, but he's so bad at it. The only way this will be successful is if we get to that theme park, is if right. we have the biggest and the best Christmas. That's the only way. Not yeah. all the silliness and funniness that's going on leading he up to that. Realize, that. The end result is going to be perfect. He doesn't realize that his own actions are what ruins it. Yeah, he seems yeah, to be... The obsessed. tree was ruined because he picked an awful tree. Yeah. The lights were ruined because he put up too many. <laughs> yeah. He seems to be really concerned about the presentation. Yeah. But he's not being present with the no. pe- with his with his family, which is right. what he wants. He wants the family to feel like they have this great Christmas, but he's not really being present. He's more fo- he's more focused on, well, if if all of the elements around us say it's a good Christmas, then it will be a good Christmas, yeah, as opposed right. to just kind of focusing on relationships. But isn't, but isn't that also like the reflection of the time and yeah, most yeah, I think people so. still, honestly? I mean, most people think that their version of perfection is the only thing that's going to be perfect. And so that is a thing that they all strive to be. This, is, this has to be this way mm-hmm. or it's not going to be perfect. I mean, um, you know, if, if it rains at a wedding, mm-hmm. I've never been married. So this is all hypothetical, obviously. Isn't but that, that ironic? Well, it is. Don't you think? <laughs> Don't you think? Oh, goodness. But if it rains at a wedding, you can either be upset and mad and have it ruin everything, or you can enjoy the moment and just say, you know what, this is a funny story that we'll have. We'll fix it. Like, yeah, it sucks. But most people want that idealistic thing of perfection. And that's what Chevy or Clark wanted and wants in most movies. And he doesn't, I- he doesn't see the things, but most people don't see the things until uh, hindsight. That's why I was going to bring up our Christmas debate. I think that there's an argument that can be made here for this to be sort of an anti-Christmas movie where it's about sort of criticism, criticizing or it's, it's providing a social commentary on that idea of being over materialistic, of putting too much emphasis on the wrong parts of Christmas and sort of, you know, by the end of the movie, the family is together, but let's face it, they've gone through uh, some pretty harrowing experiences that, you know, uh, <laughs> will make this, make, make the holiday unforgettable, mm-hmm. but also, uh, it isn't necessarily about, oh, look how giving they they became, or they learned a lesson about being generous or, or something like that. It's, right. It's kind of poking fun at the over-the-topness that uh, probably a lot of fathers in the 70s and 80s got into of trying to give their kids a better Christmas than they had. I think that's fair because because who learns who learns a lesson at the end of the movie? The boss. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's who is taught a lesson. And whereas at the end, Clark got what he wanted the whole time. He gets his money, and at his last act, as Andrew said earlier, is getting the lights to turn on. Like, mm-hmm. he's still an idiot. <laughs> 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 and that's, yeah. the, that's his thing. That's what he's supposed to be. Mm-hmm. And see, I look at it differently because I see it as he, he, wanted, what, he, he wanted that perfection, right? And then he had that moment with his dad and he kind of reassessed what was important. And then at the end of the day, everyone is in his house, dancing, having a good time, enjoying the spirit of Christmas. He did get his money. His plan worked out because again, you, you look at it from, 
he is being materialistic, yes, but if you look at it from a family perspective, this is something that he was expecting. He wanted to do something big for his family and putting in a pool to surprise them was the big Christmas present. And he had to do it based on, because they live in Chicago, again, the ground is frozen and they have to put a deposit down, whatever storyline they made up to put that situation in play. And, he, and everything worked out. And, and to him, the Christmas ended the way that he wanted. In the end, it just didn't go the way that he wanted it to. And he yeah, understood but- that it ended being with a good family Christmas, the perfect Christmas that he thought he wanted. Yeah, but he didn't really change. Yeah, he didn't. No, he did not change at all. That's what I was saying. He He did not still an idiot. For your list, remember there was there needs the character. There needs to be a great change in the character. Yeah, Brian Bill Murray. And well, the the change was from the boss. That's the that's the person who saw the error of his ways. Whereas um, Clark, it goes back to still be an idiot in Vegas. His intentions were good, but he did it wrong. Like. Mm -hmm. He yeah he wanted the big Christmas present to be the yeah. pool, but but spending that much money without telling your family is incredibly selfish and and stupid. <laughs> so that's where he's he can't he can't see past himself to do what he wants to do in the right way. He's a big dummy. <laughs> what do you think, Andrew? Yes. Well, there you go. <laughs> now um... there you have it. Is it Christmas themed? Yes. Is it a Christmas movie? Yes. <laughs> Why does my light keep going out? I don't know. I don't know. Your light keeps flashing on you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> no, it's just the yeah. There's no there's no really sense of pathos whenever it comes to Clark Clark Griswold. I mean, the only thing you can get out of it is is that like how many of you how many of you have had an experience at Christmas where it just didn't go right? Or never. My Christmases are perfect. I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know. I'm trying to think. I, mean, I guess, yeah, perfection. maybe. Yeah, I've yeah, had a you, Christmas that didn't go right. Well, like, have you ever had a Christmas that just, you know, like you wanted it to go? Well, okay? It wasn't my fault. Yeah, I mean, it's it's nobody's fault, but like, it just everything, it, it, nothing happened the way that you wanted it to, and everything just kept going wrong, one thing after another, and then to the point where you just like. Okay, I guess, but it also it makes it memorable. So that's kind of ha- that's kind of what I walk away from whenever it comes from Christmas vacation. Do I like Cro- Clark Griswold? No. In fact, I think Cousin Eddie is actually a better person than Co- than Griswold. In some ways, maybe. In some so ways, what? maybe, but he is still like a grifter. <laughs> <laughs> and he is just dumping uh, waste into the. <laughs> Into the into the rain sewer. I'd have it, Clark, buy all the dog food and the Christmas presents. <laughs> well, that aside, yes, that's yeah. not good. But like, you know, like, like cousin Eddie knows, cousin Eddie knows when you know he wants to be Clark Clark's friend. Like he mm. really wants to be Clark's friend. He's a genuinely nice guy, and he's good to Catherine. But like, uh, and he. And, and he wants to do he wants to do okay for his kids at least we hope, but like especially towards the end when he goes and kidnaps the boss and yeah. brings him back. Yeah, you know, I was like, so not ready like, for that. Yeah, it, and, and like it's it's something that like it's kind of unexpected from from Eddie, but at the same time it's like okay, you know, Eddie's got some heart. You know, it's not he's not totally he's, he might be an idiot, but like. His heart is definitely in the right place. Yeah, I think Clark says it best when he says his heart is bigger than his brain. Yeah, <laughs> without question. Or he has more hearts than brains, you know. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, the same is true for Clark. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> but I'm glad that. you brought I'm glad you brought that up, Andrew. The 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 Eddie and Clark thing because I I also wanted to briefly talk about how there are there are really three separate types of families in this movie that are like focused on throughout. And it's interesting how they all how they all perceive each other. You have the Griswolds, who are the main characters, and then you have um, particularly the cousin Eddie side of the family, who he looks down on. Mm-hmm. They're trashy, um, they're messy, and they're just not good. He doesn't want them there. And then you have the people we've not talked about at all, the neighbors. 
Oh man, Margot so and Todd, who are who are portrayed as like these uppity jerks, but are perhaps the most normal people in the movie, and are constantly tortured <laughs> by this I, by these I next kept... door neighbors, whom Clark hates. Clark yeah. hates them as much as he hates or they hate him. Yeah, and, really... and it's like they're somewhat normal. The Griswolds are slightly less so, and then the 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 Quades are very not. Uh, well, the, the the neighbors don't feel like they quite fit in to the neighborhood. They look like you know, like they're like big city yuppies. They do seem you know? to be and, big city people and living, living out here in the, in the countryside. But they were so funny to me. They reminded me of a um, couple a uh, couple of a holes, Jason Sudeikis and uh, 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 Kristen Wiig on SNL, which is just this couple that they're both just total jerks. And, uh, and at the same time, they reminded me a little bit of, uh, Seth Meyers and Amy Poehler, like the couple that really should be divorced. Um, those sketches, because they just seem like <laughs> they were married for, or they were together for some reason. Neither of them really remembers why. Um, but they were, they, they had such a funny, like they were just there to get crapped on, uh, by all of Clark's, shenanigans and <coughs> they i don't know they just made me laugh I, I was excited every time they came on screen mostly because it was julie julia louis dreyfus but yeah uh, when he comes outside and eddie's uh emptying his tank into the into the and uh what's eddie say he's like he's saying like merry christmas shitter's full merry full. christmas shitter's full <laughs> yeah they're oh, very funny man. they obviously hate each other like todd and margo on some level like you said, the the couple that should be divorced. Yeah. But they never really do anything to the Griswolds in the movie. No. But they're constantly tortured by them. Yeah. They are what are you giggling at, Andrew? But... What are you giggling at down there? You had something. Oh, oh God. No. Something from 30 minutes ago. No, no, no. <laughs> just, say, just, just now, whatever we were saying, like, shitter's full. I think I, there's people outside of my apartment. I think they heard me because they're Oh, mad. my God. <laughs> <laughs> Why are there people outside your door? Because there's people listen. walking around. Trying <laughs> to get a free, door, free listen to this. Yeah, Spotify. they got to subscribe. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, they're funny. Julie yeah. Louis-Dreyfus is very funny. This is early in her career. Um, <laughs> the first season of Seinfeld had just premiered. Um, she'd done several seasons on SNL, but didn't really become known for that. Um, so this is a good show, early showcase for her. The, okay. the only thing I'll say about the two neighbors, Todd and Margo, I didn't really think that they were kind of necessary. No, like, they aren't. They, they, they're they're really not. They're, they're not necessary at all. They're just it's there for like, humor's sake. Yeah, they're yeah, kind of there to showcase the impact on the neighbors. Like, sure. Neighbors would notice everything that happened at that home, you know? Right. right. But, like, my other thing is, is that maybe they could have touched base a little bit. They didn't have to, I guess, for time's sake, who knows, as to why they didn't like each other. Right. Like, because it does so different. It, say what? Just person, personality clashes. I guess so. Because, like, there's never really a reason why. Are you talking about the, how, why those two don't like each other? Uh, no, oh. no, no. I'm talking, I'm well, talking about like Clark. Why, why Clark, like the, why the Griswolds and those two people. Don't. Well, I mean, think about it. If the Griswolds were your neighbors, would you like them? I venture probably. to guess probably not. No, being <laughs> someone who kind of lives next door to some Griswolds, uh, it's not fun. Okay. I don't think you'd like them if you if they were Lighting your setup is quite No, 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 no. I, I'm agreeing with you. I mean, I, I, can see, I can see your reasoning now. They basically blinded them both with their power, with their, with their light <laughs> setup. That was so bright, it drained power from the city, and they had to activate their reserve nuclear uh, yeah. energy. Destroyed their sound system with an icicle. Yeah, that was... And, that and was, threw a tree through absurd. their living room. <laughs> I, was, I was so unprepared for the icicle thing. When it <laughs> shot across, I barely processed that that was exactly what happened. I, <laughs> well, and then... The thing, I went, did an icicle explode out of the gutter across the street and into their, into their, their, well, their home? Yep. And when they Same. finally decide enough's enough and they're going to say something, she gets attacked by a squirrel and a giant Rottweiler. <laughs> it is. The only so gag. You hit the a point gag. where you know when they come on screen, oh, something's going to happen. Mm -hmm. 
The only gag that was that was more uh, jarring than that was when they went tobogganing, and oh, yeah. he put all that <laughs> stuff on the bottom, and yeah. he went to go, and he was like. <laughs> Just and it gone. literally was like a rocket had gone off. Yeah, it just goes off like crazy. But that's what I always enjoy is they just take it so far. It's more than I expect. Um, it's, yeah, every time. I'm sorry, but um, go on. <laughs> All right. That's it. Yeah, unless there's anything else to add, this has been I just a wanna, fairly long we, talk. Yeah, it is. There's a lot to talk about. We didn't even talk about uh, Cousin Eddie that much. Uh, there's not really much else to say. Is this uh, Randy Quaid's best performance? This is Randy Quaid just being himself. You know, Randy <laughs> Quaid used to be a um, award-nominated actor before this movie. It's amazing to me that he had that he was Randy nominated Quaid for an Oscar, a BAFTA, Golden Globe, several Emmys. What was that performance? Yeah. Oh, he's been for several. I mean, let me—I had it pulled up just a second. He Wait, this is his most well-known role, and I think he was, it just, i think he just became him. He was nominated for an Academy Award, a BAFTA, and a Golden Globe for The Last Detail in 1973. Wow. He was nominated for another Golden Globe and an Emmy for playing President Lyndon Johnson in LBJ The Early Years. He was nominated for several Emmys for roles in A Streetcar Named Desire in 1984. Um, so, yeah. Wow. And then he I played Cousin Eddie and his life change the, the thing i knew him the best from was independence day that's what i was gonna say yeah i know him the best from being dennis quaid's brother yeah. is he dennis quaid he's their brothers I, I wasn't sure if they were brothers or cousins i just think that he has so many moments in this movie that are really funny and to me it's like were these written or were these just improv because the whole thing about the plastic plate in his head mm -hmm. uh, gets me every single time when he talks about how he had to get his metal plate replaced because every time his wife turned on the microwave, he pissed his pants and forgot who he was for half an hour. <laughs> and so they replaced it with a piece of plastic and didn't want to go flying they down the hill. It could get dented. Yeah. Yeah. And then he said, if it got dented, his hair would mess up or his hair wouldn't look right. It's just, it's just so stupid that it's got to be one of those <laughs> things that someone did someone write that or did he just go, let me just say some shit. Yeah. Cause I'm that's what it think. feels like. Yeah. Like, I think of his that, other good moments. That, that's something else, too, is that, like, I don't know how many of these moments are John Hughes and what moments are, like, improv. Yeah. But, like, I don't think very much of it is John Hughes. I couldn't find anything. I tried to figure it out because it, it really was just kind of <clears throat> the ridiculousness of, of all of that. And then, again, a lot of the little timing things, like uh, uh, when they're in the grocery store and uh, Clark and Eddie are talking, He's loading up all the dog food. There's a subtle moment where Chevy Chase is buying light bulbs and he puts it on top and it's just immediately crushed. Like yeah. it's just those little subtle things like that that I'm just like, is that improvised? Do they write things like that? Is that just because, you know, again, as much as you don't like Chevy Chase, the man, the guy is really good with comedic timing and his silliness. So even like jo Johnny Galecki talked about how he learned a lot from Chevy. Oh, I think Chevy he might a be a lot. comedic genius because he yeah. he's so perfect in this role of like uh passive aggressive is just kind of the best word for it because he's so he's so obviously rude to rant to to, to eddie right Clark but eddie's so aloof but he's he so no idea but he also is saying it. it's so veiled it's veiled just enough that also it kind of like doesn't sound like he doesn't sound mean or angry so eddie just takes it at face value yeah it's it's honestly it's it's a really good comedic duo yeah and the i know they reunite in vegas vacation i believe yes, they do Yep. Uh, the other moment that I really feel like stands out for, well, not stands out, but uh, when he's got that black dicky under that white sweater and it's just so obvious and he's looking like a buffoon and then when he goes to spin that thing and it just explodes, oh my God. <laughs> I liked just before that when he was talking about the water, the dog, start, the dog starts drinking the water down there and he goes, the dog, hey, get down from under there. He goes, oh, don't worry, that water won't hurt him. Yeah. That boy drank a whole, whole gallon of WD-40 the other week. When he went to take a leak, you should have smelt it, Clark. Yeah. <laughs> He's just so stupid and wonderful in an awful way. Oh, boy. Outside of that, I just wanted to mention that uh, once upon a time ago, the three 
David, you were not living in the complex. I don't know if you know the story, but do you know about the time that we had to chase squirrels out of Andrew's apartment? I do. I do. Okay. You, you shared the story with me of the, the, okay. the, the day the, the squirrel went berserk in Andrew's. Yeah. I mean, it's exactly a, like the movie. It really <laughs> was. It was three idiots trying to catch a squirrel in a closet. That's basically yeah. what happened. Yeah. Uh, and what happened was we gave up and they continued to live there. They, they, I think they, and I think, he, does he pay? I thought you told now? me you dropped oh. it off at like a parking lot. Somewhere. Well, he caught one of them. That's right. Yeah. yeah, what, yeah. So what happened was, was that like that night, that night I, I got really pissed off and like I went, I stood the night at you guys' apartment. Yeah. And the next man. morning I went, I went down to Lowe's and I bought like two traps. And I set one up in my bedroom. I set one up in my kitchen because God only know I didn't know where the hell they were coming in from. And and like I went out. I think I watched. I think I saw a movie. And I came back and I caught one of them. And yeah, I drove like two miles away to set it loose because I'm like <laughs> it's natural habitat. The parking lot. Yeah, it's natural habitat in the bank first parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> and like. Exactly. But like, uh, yeah, like I set my traps up. And I had my I had my traps up for like two weeks, and I went down to the front office. I'm like y'all got to fix that. And here's a picture if you want. Like, it there's was a like, picture of me out there. Uh, I think I've got socks over jeans, so the I have that can't picture. get in there. Yeah, we'll yeah. Post it I'll send it. It's you look ridiculous. like, but basically, it was a real life version of the the squirrel attack in this movie. It was wonderful. Yeah, you should see Andrew's this photo of Garrett because uh, he looks like he's trying to do like a really bad Quail Man uh, style cosplay. That was the that was the actual inspiration for the outfit. <laughs> All right, well, I, I got I don't got much else. Um, I feel like we didn't really talk about the daughter, but I don't feel like there's that much to say about her. This is actually my favorite uh, version of the Vacation Family. I think that Juliette Lewis are, is very solid as Audrey. I think her moment really shines at the beginning when she's frozen. Um, yeah. I think she's very funny as she's progressively getting more and more frozen. Um, and then Johnny Galecki is a, a very good Rusty, too. I think, See, I think they're both very good. The only thing I'll say is that, like, I like the very first, from the very first movie, I like the Rusty from that movie more than I like this one. That's Anthony Michael Hall, though. I mean, he's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he, he, like, he's, he was just really good as Rusty mm -hmm. in and the first vacation so i mean I, we need I, to get you know we have all these you know we have spider verse and all this stuff we really need the griswold verse and get all the rusties together <laughs> all the audrey's together one big epic crossover i think that yeah. would be, be that's fun. the next step for the vacation franchise into dig the it. vacation verse i dig it i hear you and ed helms too he's a rust now he is never seen the new one I didn't see it either, but I, I kind of think we've done this one now. There's four left, four official ones left. So if we ever come back around to the franchise, we got the perfect ones to do. There we go. That's All true. the ones but the Christmas one. Yep. And also, you're you're kind of missing a fifth one, Christmas Vacation 2. No, yeah. we don't talk about that. About we don't that. talk about that. I read about that. Does anybody yeah. have anything else to say? We got uh, box office? We got box office and then Hit the it. last letterbox game of the year. Oh, my God. That's I got to pull it up. Hold on. Go or Go for it. All right. Well, uh, this is the box office stats. We're going to look at the uh, how National, Chris, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation went. Um, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation debuted, as Josh said earlier, December 1st, 1989. So uh, it actually debuted in the number two spot uh, with $11.7 million, right behind a movie we've done before, Back to the Future Part Two. Um, just under it at the number three spot, was let's see back to the future what week was that in it was in its second week so not very long in the movie theaters either uh at number three you had harlem nights at number four you had uh, steel magnolias which was in its third week uh, and at number five you had disney's the little mermaid um bringing in four million dollars in its third week um so that doesn't sound like necessarily a great weekend uh well it's it's fine 11 million dollars your opening weekend number two spot finish but it wouldn't be all bad because the movie would actually stay in the top five all through Christmas. It was uh, the number two movie in its second weekend, and it was number one both the weekend before Christmas and the weekend of Christmas. So uh, it actually did really well, all things considered. 
and uh, by the end of the year would finish with $71.3 million, $71 million in the United States. So pretty good haul for a Christmas movie. Um, that's just domestic numbers. They didn't release it overseas. For the year of 1989, Christmas, vac Christmas Vacation would actually finish in the number 15 spot, uh, which is pretty good for the third movie in a franchise and a Christmas movie, um, at least for back then. Um, it would finish right behind Steel Magnolias and right above Turner and Hooch. Hmm. Um, the number one movie for 1989 was, uh, these are domestic numbers, was uh, Tim Burton's Batman, um, which we haven't gotten to yet, but I, we will someday. Uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, uh, my first uh, uh, Sony sequels movie, uh, made $197 million in the U.S. box office that year. Uh, another franchise we haven't gotten to yet, Lethal Weapon 2 was at number three that year with $147.2 million. At number four, another franchise that we haven't gotten to yet, Look Who's Talking at number four uh, with $140 million. And at number five, yet another franchise we haven't gotten to yet, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids brought in $130 million in the number five spot. Um, some other movies that we have done from that year, we've done Back to the Future Part 2. Um, let me scroll through here. Uh, we haven't done that one. We did any Indiana Jones. We did Indiana Jones. And that's what saying. Um, and then I don't think I've seen any other movies that we've done yet. Um, but some movies that we definitely might get around to include um, Ghostbusters 2. Um, let's see here. Um, Star Trek V, The Final Frontier. <laughs> um, uh, Three Fugitives, the sequel to Two Fugitives. No, I'm kidding. Um, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, we might get around to at some point. And um, it looks like all the big sequels that I can really find are all the big movies that would go on to have franchises. The uh, Best Picture winner that year, or Best Picture winner for, uh, that would be announced in 1990 anyway, was um, Driving Miss Daisy, I believe, for 1990. Um, so what else did I have here? I had one more other thing. Oh, so um, in actuality, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation is the highest grossing vacation movie, um, at least domestically. Uh, it wouldn't be passed in terms of worldwide numbers until uh, 2015's Vacation, starring Ed Helms and Christina Applegate, uh, Chris Hemsworth, a bunch of others. Um, so it's at the very top. So the other, the, the the official ranking goes: Christmas Vacation, the first Vacation movie, uh, the 2015 Vacation, European, and then Vegas. So um, we may eventually get around to those other ones. I kind of hope we do at some point. Um, did I have one other thing I wanted to say? um nope okay that's it for me so uh, now i'll turn it over to gary it's time for the letterbox game the last one of the season david you want to recap the numbers for yes. everybody so it has been uh, our first year of of using letterboxd as sort of our fun way to uh look at the rankings of the movie and how everybody else you know what the, what the people think about it and uh, i think it's actually gone pretty well um all things considered uh, midway through the year, we started doing a game to see who could get the most correct letterbox guesses for the movies. The winner would get to determine the franchise we start with next year. So in last place right now, unfortunately, Andrew Nichols with only six victories on the year. It's been a rough time for Andrew. Andrew's last win was, was uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2. Uh, there was a while where Andrew was just knocking him out, but then he got left behind somewhere along the way. Um, at number in the third, third place spot, you have Garrett. Garrett got nine right this year. Um, usually getting at least one right every, every franchise. Um, the most recent Garrett win was Jingle Jangle. And then I am in second place right behind Josh. I have 11 and then, uh, Josh has 12. So if I win today, Josh and I will tie, and we'll have to come up with some kind of fun tiebreaker that I, we might film as a separate video, something fun we could do. And then uh, we might do like that trivia game or something where we just keep naming movies that start with the same letter we until go. we win or something like that. If Josh wins, then it's over. That's it. So even though I won last week, I'm going to throw it to Garrett so we can make it interesting. 
All right. So we've got, uh, I've got it pulled up, Letterboxd. Uh, it's basically just a fan site. It's, a little, mm -hmm. it's similar to Rotten Tomatoes, but different, uh, where there are no critic score, there are no fan score. Every score is weighted the same, mm -hmm. which makes it a little more fair in our opinion, a little more fun than just Rotten Tomatoes. So uh, we are going to, I'm gonna throw it to you guys. Uh, Andrew, what is your guess for Christmas? My guess is if Andrew wins and Josh wins too. <laughs> three point nine. Three point nine. Okay. Uh, David. So I've written here three point four. Okay. Oh, you know how we should have done this. Oh, I think I know what we should do in the. Well, no, that won't work. But go ahead. It's on you, baby. Three point four is what. Three point four is what you want to go with. Okay, the final answer. Let's say we should have written it down and then yeah. reveal. That's what we'll do next time. <laughs> All right, Josh. You got the same score. Briggs. No pressure or anything, bud. Y'all really hosed me. I feel like. <laughs> <laughs> well, I went with my heart on this one. Listen to your heart. Cause well, it's see, see An you. Andrew picked the number that was in my head. <sighs> I don't know if it's the right thing to do to go higher. Well, you're gonna be you're gonna be fine, I think, no matter what, because you could guess lower than Andrew. If Andrew wins, you win. True. And if that you win, true. you win. I could try to. So throw as it. long as, if anything, best advice I would give you is guess three point eight, because if it's lower than Andrew, probably gonna win. But I mean, only if it's three point only if it's three point what five or lower do I win. Do do what you, do what you feel is right. <laughs> there you go. Listen to your heart, Josh. Because it's waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm gonna. Is that the? Oh. Oh. <laughs> I want to. I can't decide. I either want to split the difference, which is the safe move. Or I want to go above 3.9, which is the risky move, but I feel like has a small chance of paying off. <laughs> mm -hmm. I feel like it is not impossible that this movie has a 4.0. I don't think it's much higher than that, but I think right. it is very possible that it broke a 4. But I don't want to let David win <laughs> if it's under 3.8. Yeah. This is a tough one. This is a, this is for all the marbles, friends. Whoever wins gets to pick what we start with next season. So there really is some pressure here. I'm trying to be the announcer here as we build tension to, to Josh's big decision. Again, if Andrew wins, Josh wins. If Josh wins, Josh wins. If David wins. A tiebreaker system will have to be created for this first time ever situation. Can you feel the pressure? Can you feel the <laughs> Andrew's, pressure? Andrew's so tense, he's pumping iron over there. <laughs> he's just over there ready. Pumping iron over here. I got Iron Man Mouse right there. Kick him out the video. <laughs> what you going to do, man? I'm going to put a clock on you. Because of what I think this movie is going to be, I'm going to split the difference and pick 3.7. Okay. I don't think it's a four. I think it could be, but I don't think so. I leave some wiggle room. 3.7, <laughs> final answer. 3.7 or 3.8? 3.7, okay. just because David said eight, and I don't want to take his, <laughs> I don't want to take his advice. <laughs> okay, so recap it. It's been 40 years since I heard the other two guesses. Andrew, you said you had a? No one's, no one's listening anymore. 3.9, anyway. David, 3.9. 3.4? I had a 3.4. Three Three point four and Josh with a three point seven. Man, this is close. It's very it's very nifty. I will tell you now that it does not include Andrew, unfortunately. Andrew 
went a little high. So there is a chance that one of you got it right. But it, it didn't happen. Neither one of you got oh, it. Oh, okay. No, no, not exactly right. Okay. So there could be five <laughs> ways. Josh could win. The score for Christmas Vacation, as I continue to build, is 3.6. So Josh just won. Oh! <laughs> by by point 0.1. Point 0.1. Point 0.1. Josh. I'm oh, very glad I didn't go with that 3.8 now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Have been a tiebreaker. <laughs> That would have been the tiebreaker. Josh gets to pick what we start with next season. Season three champion. Wow. Do you want to make the announcement now, or are you going to wait? You know, you're going to make. Oh, I don't know what I'm going to pick. (laughs) We'll make the announcement later. When I was thinking about it all year, I was thinking about it all year. Do you know what we would have started with? What What would we have started with? We would have started with Tim Burton's Batman and Batman Mm. Returns. I'm still not going to say that I wouldn't pick that. Still might. Yeah. You and still I might. Debating, I was debating pitching to you guys doing it as sort of like a split series because we would do like Batman Returns and Batman, right? And then later we would come back and we would do the Schumacher Batman films. Mm-hmm. Even though technically those are considered one little group, I kind of feel like change it up to directors. Yeah. So, Gary, did you have any ideas for what you wanted to start with? Nope. I knew I was out of the running. Didn't even think about it. <laughs> okay. Wow, exciting. Well, how appropriate that our last regular episode of the year went incredibly long. Yep. <laughs> that is fine and dandy. Um, yeah. So we will be back before the end of the year for one more episode, our end of the year wrap-up. It's going to be super fun. It's going to be wheels off. It's going to be streets ahead. It's going to be a bonanza. Mm. I mm. think I've appropriately built it up. Yeah, I think that's right. So keep an eye out for that. Find us online, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Letterboxd. We're so many sequels or so many sequels pod on all of those. Um, It wouldn't be very hard to find us. Uh, Subscribe in your favorite podcasting app and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. um, So that you keep getting all of our content sent straight to you. Turn on those notifications. Um, If you're using Apple podcasts, it'd be real cool if you left us a rating and review. You would be our friend. Yes. You would be our best friend if you did that. Uh, Otherwise, that's it for us. Um, Have a very Merry Christmas Mm -hmm. or Happy Holiday or whatever you're celebrating. I hope it's a good one. 